I'm Harish Saluja and this is one of my short stories. I'm writing a book called A House at the Crossroads, which is going to have most of my short stories, but some of the stories are uh, not long enough or perhaps interesting enough. So I'm uh, videotaping them. This one is called uh, Arrival of the Normandy Train. Arrival of the Normandy Train. So one of my favorite poets, a uh, German poet named Rilke, is regarded as one of the greatest poets of uh, all time. He wrote mostly in German, uh, wrote uh, about 400 poems in French also. He wrote a book called Letters to a Young Poet, which should be on the bedside of all artists and authors and uh, creative people. Uh, I have read it many times. A small book, uh, among uh, other things, uh, he, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. Um, he talks about uh, solitude, the necessity and the importance of solitude. I know in America it's not considered uh, uh, healthy to, to, to cherish solitude, but for, he says, for artists, it's important. Love your solitude and try to sing out with the pain it causes you. Uh, things like that. And in good marriage is one in which each partner appoints the other to safeguard each, the, each of their solitude. Anyway, so one of his poems is called Archaic Torso of Apollo, a very famous poem. Uh, it details the beauty and the power of a torso which the poet uh, finds in the desert. Yeah, so he's no head, no legs, and yet he can see the beauty and the majesty uh, of the sculpture. It's one of his uh, many thousands of uh, wonderful poets, uh, poems he wrote. Anyway, I read this poem a long time ago, and like everyone else, was struck by the uh, startling line with which it ends. So he describes the, the poem, the beauty, and so forth and so forth, and then he says, Du must dein Leben andren, my German pronunciation is not good. Uh, apologies. Du must diamond, du must dein Leben andern. Wonderful line. It translates as you must change your life. What? What's that got to do with the beauty of the sculpture? You must change your life. Okay. Who am I to argue? Uh, it reminds me of the ending of the film uh, Taste of Cherries. You know, you you familiar with that? I'm sure Abbas Kristami's famous, famous film, Taste of Cherries, which suddenly ends with the, the video of the crew and the director and the sound people and so forth at the end of a very poignant moment when the uh, protagonist uh, presumably commits suicide. Anyway, all of us who are introspective have often said this line, you must change your life for one reason or the other. Um, but I didn't really understand why this appeared at the end of uh, Archaic Torso of Apollo uh, by Rilke. Anyway, what do I know? Um, years passed and I found myself at uh, the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, this was my first uh, visit to Chicago. This was many years ago. Uh, Chicago hasn't been the same since Al died. That's the joke. Nobody got it. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we were there for work and with some colleagues, and uh, um, last day we decided to go to the Art Institute of Chicago, which is the second largest, uh, I believe, art museum in the country. Huge, huge collection. I have a whole system uh, when I go to uh, a museum. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to stop by each painting and then have a discussion with somebody. This is a very personal, private, beautiful time for me. So I generally uh, make an appointment with whoever I am that I'll meet you in the lobby four hours, three hours from now, and so forth. And so and so that's it. So uh, went around the museum, beautiful Iranian miniatures, contemporary art, some classics, uh, and and. Uh, Near the end of my time, 
uh, I came across the Impressionist room. Didn't know they had so many Impressionists. Uh, now it's going to take more time. So I went, ran downstairs, saw my colleagues, and uh, and tell them that I was going to be another hour. And I went back to the Impressionist room. So I have. I read the biographies of all the impressionists, you know, being an artist myself, uh, and I am on the on first name basis with all of them. So I stand in the middle of the room and I say, "How Vincent, hello Vincent, you know, Vincent Van Gogh, hello Paul, Cezanne, and so forth, you know. I recognize most of the paintings, I've seen them in books, have been studying them since I was a child, and been fascinated by them. And then eventually got a chance to see most of them in the great museums in the world, like Musée Orsay and so forth. Anyway, so I go around, start going around, uh, you know, remembering and admiring each of the paintings. And and then I suddenly came across this painting by Claude Monet. I had seen this since childhood uh, in the books and was always stunned by it, absolutely found it fascinating. Uh, it's called Gare Saint-Lazare, train station at Saint-Lazare. Those of you who know Paris, it's the second largest, uh, I believe, uh, train station uh, in Paris, uh, Gare du Nord being the first one. And this one called train station in Saint-Lazare, and more accurately, arrival of the Normandy train at Gar Saint Lazare. Beautiful painting, small painting, painted in the 1870s, has mostly uh, uh, smoke. Uh, a train has arrived, steam engine train has arrived, people have gotten off, and it's in the shed, and smoke is billowing out of the train. Um, and uh, it's just so light and so perfect. So uh, I've seen, I had seen this uh, in books, and and I didn't realize I was going to come across it. There's one in Muse d'Orsay. There's one at the Harvard Museum. I think Monet painted about uh, twelve of these, and God knows how many uh, are in public domain. But anyway, this one is at Art Institute, and a chill went down my spine. And uh, it's like you know meeting an old friend, somebody I had known for thirty, forty years, and so forth. There was a bench in front of the painting. So I sat down on the bench and kept looking at it, you know, very small painting, two feet, by two and a half feet. Uh, and, but in this this little space, he ca captures magic. You know, so. Anyway, uh, you know, I've been painting all my life. And over the years, the canvases have become larger and, you know, bigger and, uh, uh, and I claim I need literally larger canvases, I need more time, I need better, uh, you know, benefactors, people who like my work and galleries, you know, all the shonen galleries and, and so forth. And uh, But the fact is I find excuses not to work. Uh, I'm lazy, you know, and and keep wondering about my capabilities. Um, and there are always reasons not to work, as most writers and artists know. Anyway, so uh, so here is this painting. It's not that large. It's not that complicated. You know, 100, 1870s, long time ago, he painted this beautiful work, you know. And, and so I had the, this museum floor map with me, and I always carry a pen with me in case, you know, some new idea strikes. Um, uh, so I started writing that, look at this, look at this marvelous work. Uh, you know, the fact is I, that I am lazy and, and, and I have a little bit of talent. Uh, I should come my shortcomings by working hard. Everybody knows that, you know, if you have a little bit of talent, but work hard and you, you, you can make some progress and so forth. But I don't do that. I'm, I make excuses and I, you know, look at this. And, and and I should face reality. I should shut up and get to work. Like like Rodin, Rodin said to Rilke, you know, uh, uh, everybody, you must uh, uh, always work. I think it's il faut toujours travailler, you know. 
Again, my pronunciation is terrible. You must always work. So I'm writing this down and then I write, I need to change my life. Oh. I suddenly remember the Rilke poem. All those years later, in the face of beauty, in the face of excellence, well, excellence, you know, there is a great mathematical equation or a person or a beautiful shot on a basketball court or Lionel Messi scoring a goal, uh, nature, music, you know, one should be inspired to strive to better oneself in face of such beauty. Now, scholars have different interpretations of that last line in the poem. Uh, some some of that is too obscure for a simple person like me, and I'm sure my interpretation is uh, uh, perhaps wrong. But for me, for me, it was a call for action. You come across some someone's achievements and something wonderful and beautiful they have done, and you need to look at yourself and say, go, get up, get to work. Anyway, so I'm, I'm sitting there and I was interrupted, uh, lost in my thoughts, writing down, scribbling, and I was interrupted by a woman and she came over and tapped on my shoulder and says, she was looking at me with great concern. Uh, are you okay, sir? Oh, why won't I be okay? And I said, yeah, what's the problem? She says, well, apparently it looked like, it, it, it turned out that I had tears running down my fat cheeks. And then she was worried that, you know, uh, I was very upset. So I smiled, I said, yeah, I was okay. I was more than okay. I was perfect, actually. 